Welcome to the Control the Room podcast, a series devoted to the exploration of meeting culture and uncovering cures for the common meeting. Some meetings have tight control and others are loose. To control the room means achieving outcomes while striking a balance between imposing and removing structure, asserting and distributing power, leaning in and leaning out, all in the service of having a truly magical meeting. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to join us live for a session sometime, you can join our weekly Control the Room Facilitation Lab. It's a free event to meet fellow facilitators and explore new techniques, so you can apply the things you learn in the podcast in real time with other facilitators. Sign up today at voltagecontrol.com slash facilitation dash lab. If you'd like to learn more about my new book, Magical Meetings, you can download the Magical Meetings Quick Start Guide, a free PDF reference with some of the most important pieces of advice from the book. Download a copy today at voltagecontrol.com slash magical dash meetings dash quick dash guide. Today, I'm with Diana Joseph at the Corporate Accelerator Forum, where she guides and gathers corporate innovators who work with startups. She is the co-host of the Ecosystem Show on Clubhouse and author of many research papers, articles, and blog posts. Welcome to the show, Diana. Thanks so much, Douglas. Yeah, it's great to have you. So let's talk a little bit about how you got your start in the world of corporate innovation. Sure. I'm going to take you back a little bit. So I'm a learning scientist by training. That's an interdisciplinary field that draws on education, computer science, cognitive science, and tries to understand how learning works. And then given how learning works, trying to create learning experiences that are very effective and sticky, memorable, actually make a change in our skills and mindsets. And uh, in that work, I in my, in my dissertation work, I focused on something called the Passion Curriculum Project. I was really interested in, in learner interest and how we might create curriculum that uses learner interest to get at the skills and mindsets and knowledge that, let's say, adults want young people to get. So I was working with fourth graders, fifth graders, and trying to focus on something that really interested them. Uh, and it was it was really hard. So I also had to work on the methodology to help us make sense of that challenge. Uh, so that was called design-based research. So uh, I, I had kind of the seeds of my thinking about self-determination there and the seeds of my thinking about 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 design and iteration uh, that were part of that part of that methodology, uh, and then I I had children and moved to be closer to my parents and took a job with Adobe where I ran a research group during the time when Adobe was moving all of its products, but even first its its learning content to the cloud. So I ran the research group that was helping the people who used to write that fat book that came in the Photoshop box. Instead of being writers, those people now had to become almost anthropologists. They had to understand what was going on in the world of their product and who, who needed what and who should produce what because they were shifting to community content um, now that the cloud was a possibility. So very interesting work helping them change and doing both quantitative and qualitative research. And then I got exposed to their internal innovation program, which was called Kickbox. Have you heard of that mm, one? Yeah, of course. There's okay. um, some really great materials online still. You know, as far as I know, it's it's uh, it's not around anymore, but all the old materials are still there for folks to check out. And there's some really interesting stuff for sure to, that I, I advise you know, all facilitators to check out and think about how it might influence your practice. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I second that recommendation. And it is actually coming back. Somebody bought the Kickbox concept and uh, it's coming back. So um, Douglas, I'll make sure to tell you about a session that's coming up where we're going to talk with some folks with from IKEA, an innovation leader about and the the folks who are doing that the Kickbox stuff now. Nice, awesome. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So Kickbox was a really in inspiring experience. I almost, if people are going to look at it, okay, I'm going to have to tell you. <laughs> I was thinking about keeping it secret until they look later, but I'm going to have to tell you for context right now. So Kickbox comes c comes with a beautiful boot camp. I had the opportunity, I was in maybe the third cohort at Adobe with the inventor of the Kickbox program, Mark Randall, who's just an amazing, inspiring 
person. What's Mark doing now? I think he's retired for the most part. Mm. Even then was very focused on his family. And so I, I think he's he's Smart been man. able to enjoy that, right? So beautiful experience, really inspiring. And at the end of the boot camp, you get this red box, and inside the red box are a bunch of resources. There are sticky notes and Sharpies, and there's a timer, and there's some chocolate and some coffee. And by the third cohort, I knew the most important thing that was in there, which was a prepaid credit card. It was a card with $1,000 on it. And that was really mind-blowing because, I mean, I was, it was a good corporate job. I had money. I could have spent $1,000 of my own money on any project at any given time without feeling the pinch, particularly. But this was $1,000 worth of company budget, and no one had ever delivered trust to me in that way before. If I wanted money, I had to fight for it or, or you know, expense something that everyone that already sort of fell into a set of expectations. And with this, Adobe was saying to me personally, we trust you. Here's some resources. Go do something interesting. And if it turns out to be interesting, if it turns out you think we'd be interested too, come back and tell us. But otherwise, we trust you that it's a worthy expenditure of your time and money. And it was just, it, it just completely changed my relationship to the company. You know, it's really fascinating to hear you mention this notion of trust that never been delivered to me in that way before. Yeah, and, yeah. and I'm about to do a, a, a talk on innovation culture and how we can deliver that in meetings. And we're kind of breaking it up into three phases. And one of them is the invitation and uh-huh. so, you know, I'm almost thinking I want to bring the story into that, into that yeah. presentation now, because that's such a beautiful story of inviting innovation because, yes. you know, that delivery of trust to you was a really strong invitation to do something yes. um, and, it, and it meant a lot to you, right? That, mm-hmm. that was a significant kind of gesture. Yes. Yes, exactly. They didn't have to say anything else to make it clear that I was, it was okay for me to do something that could fail. They didn't have to say a lot of words about failure. It was just like, here's money. If it turns out interesting, tell me. So that took a lot of weight off that whole idea of failure as well. And because it happened to be me, it really harkened back to the work I had done in graduate school. I talked about self-determination and the Passion Curriculum Project, the thorny challenge I ran into in in trying to make these interest-centered experiences happen is that we are really complex when it comes to motivation. Most of us are. You do meet people who are absolutely zeroed in on a particular thing. Like I have a nephew who's wanted to be a race car driver since he was five and he's 22 now and guess what? He's a race car driver, okay? But most of us, it's not like that. Most of us don't have that kind of focus where we've, we're giving up a lot of other things that we could be interested in. Uh, most of us who were, especially if we were good in school, we have a lot of achievement motivation that's going. We want to get that high score. We want to be, we, we want to get ranked the way our context can rank us, right? So there's achievement motivation. There's maybe really deep interest. There's social motivations. We want to be like somebody and we want to be unlike somebody else that, that connects with identity. So there's so many things that are going on. It was really hard to thread that needle. I was just thinking that I would imagine it can be difficult to sometimes align those things. They can sometimes be at odds with each other. If you're trying to Mm -hmm. self-actualize your dreams and this notion of wanting to be successful on the test or, or whatever this, you know, whatever context is thrown at you, that situation may not align with this future goal. Right. And that, that can be hard. Absolutely. And those things can be in tension with each other. And I think in general, we're not aware of those different motivations that are going. So because we're not aware of them, we can't use them as handles. Once we become aware, okay, well, so I have my dreams are in tension. There's a, there's a, some kind of conflict between my, the step I need to take to pursue my dream and the step I need to take to score well on somebody else's evaluation. Okay, well, can I invent my own evaluation that would align better? And can I give that primacy in my mind? Right? So the awareness becomes really useful. You know, it makes me think about young adults that have responded to coaching advice with the phrase, can I do that? You know, it's like this notion of like, wait, I can write my own test? And it's like, yeah, you can. I think our our system has, has programmed folks to feel like there's one way 
to navigate one way to succeed. And, um, and then, then I think that permeates our work life and meetings, you know, and mm-hmm. we run into this all the time with how folks show up as professional and they're mm-hmm. expected to behave or be a certain way. And I think a lot of times that's at odds with our desire to innovate, ideate, create when we come in and we stifle all that because we're trying to be so buttoned up and professional. And so that brings me to something that we were talking about in our pre-show chat, which is this work that you do, bringing together corporates and startups. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I think startups are like maybe more stereotypically playful. They're in the garage tinkering, you know, they're the explorers, they're the little sapling that's just kind of just going any which way it can to find the sunlight. Whereas like, you know, the big corporates, the big oak tree, that's like, it is what it is. It's like not very malleable. It's established. And so there must be some really interesting stories or even tactics that you found Mm -hmm. to help bridge that gap and bring those two together so they can work Mm -hmm. together without the, you know, the classic example I've always heard is like startups working with corporates is kind of like dancing with elephants. And so Mm -hmm. how do, how do you help the, the startup not get crushed by the elephant? That's such an important question. Let me give you a little more context of the kinds of experiences that I'm creating. Sometimes I'm bringing together the corporates with each other. So corporate innovators who work with startups need to talk to other corporate innovators who work with startups because it's really hard to develop best practices by yourself. It's really hard to see what's happening in the landscape when you only have one perspective to look from. And you're also in this challenging social situation where you're balancing, you're sitting in that exact tension that you were talking about, Douglas. Your job is to connect the internal stakeholders who have these very, very aligned tasks to fulfill every quarter that have been promised all the way up the hierarchy to the SEC. And on the other hand, you have your external stakeholders who are the startups, and they have a totally different set of goals and timelines that are truly existential for their company or their idea. And so the corporates like to talk to each other, that th- there's value in them just talking to each other within that same role. And then of course, we there are times when we bring the corporates and the startups together to talk about what's getting in the way. I'm working in situations where both sides recognize that it's important to make that, make that connection happen, but they haven't been, been able to figure out how to do it. And then there are other times when we're thinking about the whole ecosystem and we have people from, we have stakeholders from all mm-hmm. around a region or all around a particular industry challenge. So to zero in on the context where we have corporates and startups at the table, I'll tell you the story of, a, of an experience that we built in December of 2019, which I want to say is last year. There's like a whole <laughs> missing one in there, but uh, it was one of our one of our last live experiences that we did before the pandemic. One important part of it was the curation. So we worked very very closely with the corporates who were the sponsors of the experience to understand what they saw uh, as the challenges that were stopping them from really uh, connecting with the startups. This was for the materials industry. It was called bridging the gap: materials giants and startups. So we curated on the on the giant's side to understand what the what the most critical questions were, and then we curated on the startup side. We went out went out and found startups who uh, had their own challenges and questions, not necessarily the exact same ones that that would work together, though that was certainly possible. Um, but someone who had startups who had tried working with corporates and had good perspective on what had and hadn't worked in that context. And then we designed a separate moment within that day long workshop. We designed a separate moment for each of those, for each of those curated topics. One of them was a discussion. One of them was a poster fair. The corporates felt like they never got a chance to tell, they listened to pitches from the startups all the time, but they never get a chance to tell the startups what they're about what they care mm. about, what matters to them. So they got to have a poster fair. I love that. You know, I was part of a, an event. I got brought in to help with an event where a group was working with corporates and they were kind of defaulting to their normal kind of practices and standard like protocols, right? And one of them was like this, the startup pitches, right? Mm-hmm. And I, was th- I couldn't help but think to myself, like, 
man, you brought these corporates in and they're just going to listen to a bunch of pitches. Like, uh, I mean, it seems like there's so much more potential there, you know? And if I was at a corporate, I don't know if I'd want to come like mentor startups and give them advice on their pitches and listen to pitches versus like help try to solve my problem. Right. Yeah. And, and celebrate my wins. Everyone loves a little stroke of the ego. Right. <laughs> and so this poster event sounds, sounds as music to my ears because I feel <laughs> like so many times the corporates are just brought in and kind of paraded around these typical kind of situations that the startup community is kind of doing. And it's mm-hmm. like, I think if we're going to bridge ecosystems, we need to rethink things. And it sounds like you're exploring mm-hmm. some new approaches. Yeah, I think it's what you're describing is the only moment where the corporates and startups get to talk to each other is this performative moment of the pitch. So the startups have worked on that and they've polished it and they boil it down to something tiny. And either it hits exactly what the corporates happen to need or it doesn't. Because in that context, that's the only thing the corporates are listening for is, is does it hit? Okay, great. It's a pitch. Either it's going to solve my problem or it won't. What we did in this event it was to change the conversation to be like, how can we work together better? It was mm. a side, it, it's on the side. So uh, it's a little bit disarming. You don't have, it's not that only that one moment you get to have a longer conversation, get a sense for what these people are like as people while working on something that's important to both of you. It's also explorative and generative too, right? So like mm-hmm. there's new things that emerge from that situation versus like just things that are going into it. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. That's really beautiful. That's cool. So what are some of the things that you found that make for good relationships or foster better connection through these Mm -hmm. folks that seem to be at completely different levels and vantage points? There's a game that I like to play at the beginning of every session. And I'm sure I stole parts of it from somewhere. So I apologize to whoever I'm not crediting. (laughs) but I call it spectrum. And the way it works is I ask a question to which the answer is a quantity. So it's, it, it's a a number or a size or something like that. And then people need to move in the room to represent their answer to that question. So I might say, how old is your company? So in, in the materials room, for example, this event I was describing, there was a company that's 150 years old. And there's another company that just incorporated two weeks ago, right? So you can, you can see the difference and you can see that there could even be some overlap. Size of company, not much overlap there. Comfort level with innovation. We could see among the corporates how things were different there. And because people have to move around, they have to talk to each other to find the right place. If I ask how long have you been in your current position, people have to move and they have to talk with each other. So there's an icebreaker component to that. There's a informational component to that because we can all see in the room the answer to this question. It inspires other questions. So people start to put in, well, here's what I'd like to see next. Here's Mm -hmm. what I'd like to see us represent next. And that gets the ball rolling on dialogue. Yeah, I've heard that referred to as the human histogram. And I love it because it's visual right to your point there's there's information that's being shared but it's highly visual we can just look across the room and get a really quick read on it and then to your point as people are getting inspired by oh i'd like to see this next Mm -hmm. you're building alignment commitment connection all these good things are kind Mm -hmm. of coming out it's that's really really great and i love that uh you've got these two groups and you're thinking about questions that might cause a little bit of, of blurring of the boundaries, which can be a really right. eye-opening moment for them. It's like, maybe we're not so different. Right. How long does it take you to get a contract signed? Yeah, <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Wow. It is <laughs> amazing. So I want to talk a little bit more about the designing of your experience. It's, mm-hmm. Because, you know, I think that's something that our listeners do a lot of. Mm -hmm. And also, when we talk about meetings, you know, this is something that we're passionate about, you know, drawing inspiration from folks that are creating workshops, events, any kind of experience, and how do we make our everyday meetings experiences 
And, you know, the advice mm-hmm. of just bringing an agenda is, is just not enough, right? We mm-hmm. need to think about what is the arc of the experience? How does it start? Mm-hmm. How does it end? And how do we want people to feel? Mm-hmm. I mean, even, even if people just did a, a human histogram in their status meeting, right? That might, <laughs> I mean, that might elevate things a little bit. It'll be memorable, yeah. that's for sure. So I'd right. love to hear more about your process for designing experiences and if there's any tips or tricks or yeah. things that listeners might be able to borrow from. Great. I mentioned curation. So these aren't quite everyday meetings. These are sort of big, significant milestone meetings that we're having. So they, it's, it feels appropriate to invest a lot into the curation. Uh, so we, we know that the questions we're addressing are burning questions before we go in. We think a lot about who in the room should kick off the discussion or the workshop around a particular question. It's not often an expert. It's often somebody who has the problem, uh, someone who can tell a story about it, someone who is puzzled by it. By starting with a question or starting with a puzzle, that invites, it creates a white space. It it creates space that the rest of the community, the rest of the people at the meeting can speak into. So right from the beginning, we're sort of creating a vacuum that pulls participation forward. If that makes any sense, that makes total sense. I and I, I love this idea of bringing the, the non expert into. Well, we, we always talk about how you know, when you're in a complex system, experts aren't super valuable because their experience may not be applicable, right. and experts have a tendency to bring the solutions that worked in the past, and you know what we're facing right now might not be exactly what that expert saw Mm -hmm. if they're able to listen to someone who's who's going through something and share that story then they might be able to take all their experience and offer up some interesting insights Mm -hmm. but if we start with the expert it might you know all the people experiencing stuff it might cloud their memory or even their vantage point of they might get this false sense of hope that oh i I just go take that pill the expert mentioned (laughs) it'll be all good right whereas if we start with that curiosity that story it also shapes the narrative right like because we're we're, that's the perspective we're going to look at it from you make me think of the design thinking toolkit concept of the t-shaped person right so so everyone in the room has some expertise we curate for that as well you have some expertise it's different expertise from the person next to you so if you're if you're very very good in some particular point but you're also very good at connecting listening and sharing then the group together can make a lot more sense. I think you have to have expertise. Again, in a complex system, there there are going to be pieces of it that could be oversimplified if there are no experts in the room. If you put the experts in a context where where there's dialogue between them and between the generalists, between them and the generalists, there's a lot of power there. 100%. And, you know, I I had written down a bunch of notes as you were talking today (laughs) and there's some things I was able to come back to and other things that just kind of got, you know, got lost in the forward momentum. The one thing I'm going to come back to, because it applies to what we're saying now, is you mentioned anthropology. And mm-hmm. it's it just struck me just then. It's just like, you know, a lot of this work is about being a an anthropologist, whether we studied it in school or not, right? Like you're mm-hmm. kind of thinking about what's <laughs> what's going on here and how do we shape this little mini tribe, if you will? Yeah. When you said that, it made me think of myself as an anthropologist trying to understand people. But also, I think, I never thought about it this way before, but I think I'm also trying to invite everyone else in the room to be an anthropologist. Mm-hmm. Let's let's understand each other. And it, it comes back to something that you said before also about invitation. That I think the primary job that I have in designing these experiences is to create the invitation for uh, participation, the invitation to bring your ideas, the invitation to bring your questions. And that's what really shapes the outcomes. I totally agree. I think th- that your point around nailing the research, so often we, we, we see issues with teams and just not doing enough preparation, right? Mm-hmm. It's like they could kind of intuit the moves. They could come together and collaborate but the thing is, is if we haven't done the research up front, we don't even know what meeting we're having. 
We don't right. even know what workshop we're doing. We're just kind of maybe going through some motions or we kind of put something on the calendar because we felt like the project needed to move forward. But if we just spend some time thinking about the questions we want to ask, mm -hmm. thinking about who might need to ask that question or share that story, I think everything else, especially if you've got any bit of experience or skill, everything else works itself out, right? Like once you figure that stuff yeah. out, it's like, Oh, boom, 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 boom. Like I'm, it's all unfolding before me. Yes, yes, exactly. It's almost like the more careful curation and design I do up front, the less active facilitation I do in the room mm. because we've made the space call forth the behaviors that we're looking for. We've made the timeline call forth the behaviors we're looking for. We've made the materials call forth the behaviors we're looking for. And then as facilitators, we can just come in and make a little point here and there to, to move things along if they, if they need anything. Yeah. I'd love to talk about setting the initial conditions, you know, mm -hmm, it's almost mm -hmm. like a science experiment, you know, it's like mm -hmm. when they built a large hydrogen collider, <laughs> They didn't just get in there and just say, oh, how do we guide these particles? They came up with a very, very solid hypothesis based on research, set up very specific guidelines, right. and then let it run. And then if stuff popped up that was unexpected, then they would address those things. Right. And the, right. when they run an experiment, they were probably just kind of sitting back for the most part and just, you know, monitoring, making sure everything's good. And to me, I never really thought about the analogy of of a facilitators or research scientists, but that's probably not mm -hmm. a bad way to approach it. Which brings yeah. me back to another point that I had written down that I want to hear more about, which is design-based research. Yeah. So help me understand a little bit more about, I can intuit based on some of the things you were saying, but it sounded like it's a very developed methodology or body of work. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and how it continues to play a role in your work today. Mm -hmm. Design-based research is a social science framework that recognizes that things are going to change. If you are doing work that's intended to change the world, intended to change even a small world, right? If, if, you're, if you're researching something that is intended to change its local environment, then your data is going to change. So a survey is not going to work. An interview is not going to work. You, we, we needed, the, there were uh, actually a number of us who were thinking about building learning environments that were supposed to have impact. And we knew that we were going to need to iterate based on what we were learning. So uh, we had to sit down and lay out what would be a disciplined way of thinking about that. It, it can't be just that we randomly do whatever we feel like. That's not, that, that's not, uh, that's not science. Uh, it's not comparable. It's not credible. On the other hand, if we, if we, uh, tried to hold, if we tried to control, you know, like in a lab science experiment, if we try to have a control group, that doesn't work in the, in the context of education because the, the, we're, it's, it's people who are, who are doing things. You can't teach one way for an hour and then teach a different way for another hour without being influenced across across those two cases. So uh, we had to think about iteration. We had to think about uh, uh, how we could change goals. Maybe we would discover, maybe we discovered in the course of our work that the that we had the wrong intentions to begin with. We had to be willing to change any piece of it. So we actually formed something that we ended up calling the Design-Based Research Collective. Uh, and about 10 of us uh, worked together very closely for, uh, I don't know, it was a long time ago now, maybe a year, um, to, to lay out the ideas we had about how design-based research uh, could work. And we're still, it's, uh, it, it's interesting, we still see people uh, citing that, that, early, that early paper from time to time. Um, the way it works for me most now is it's very close to design thinking. Mm. So design-based research and design thinking are very similar to each other in that they, they focus on the, in that they permit iteration. They focus on, uh, the, the design, creating something that's useful. The biggest difference is that 
in design-based research, we're trying to develop theory. We're trying to understand what are the repeatable principles from doing something this way. And in design thinking, we're trying to make something. I think that on the research side, we're not always good about finishing the project and getting it out in the world to have impact. Something that graduate students work on and then they move on to something else. On the other hand, design thinking is not as strong at developing the theory. So we make something that's really powerful, but what happens to the lessons that we learned from that experience? Often they just kind of blow away in the wind. So sitting in the middle, but ha having experience with both of these uh, has been really helpful for me in remembering to pay attention to both sides of that equation. Wow, that's super fascinating. I'm going to have to dig the paper up and check it out because <laughs> I can completely understand and appreciate what you're saying about how the theory gets left behind, right? Because mm. while design thinking can make change in the world, that change is driven by economic interests. And sure, there's probably some nonprofits and stuff that are like, you know, doing some design thinking, but at the end of the day, those people get grants and they have budgets. And so there's like, there's funding that's driving this work, right? And so there's limits to how the focus, right? And, mm -hmm. and so the focus is deliver this thing, deliver this change. There's a lack of focus or incentives and rewards to codify and extract out the principles, the theory, the repeatable, like, what does this mean for greenhouse gases? I don't care. I'm working on like, you know, cleaning like water or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. I, I think the same is true on the other side. So if you're in academia, whatever methods or whatever field you're in, there's also a need to make that financially sustainable. So you're writing grants and those grants are dependent on you writing papers that are publishable. And it takes a really long time to collect the data that uh, allows you to publish that's a much slower timeline than actually producing something that works, right? So producing something that works well enough to collect the data is as far as you really need to go if your incentives are to, uh, to raise funding for your lab and get tenure. You don't have to finish the, you don't have to finish the things that you're making. So it, it takes really something. And there are many professors who, who get past that. They have to really invest in bringing it forward into the world because it's not what they're incentivized on to begin with. In the same way that if you're in design thinking or innovation in any context, you're incentivized to make something happen. You're not incentivized to sit down. And it really takes something for you to invest the time to write it down in a way that you'll remember and that others will remember and maybe not make the same mistake twice. You know, there's also we're get, we're getting into like some some interesting territory, but uh, <laughs> you know, there's another issue that I think academia faces, which is a a big challenge, right? Because it, even if you do get passionate about pursuing the work and you take it out to go kind of productize or or commercialize and expand it out, there's this concept of voltage drop, which is like the work we did in the, in the lab and the hypotheses we had and the research we did, once we start taking it to different audiences or different scenarios, we start to realize, oh, okay, this actually like is not quite as repeatable in different scenarios, mm -hmm. right? And and now we have to go figure out why that is and do I mm -hmm. have the energy <laughs> or the runway to go do that? Or is there another problem that might be more interesting than go research, right? So it's like the trade-offs yeah. of like what I love to do, what I have the gumption to do, and is it even a solvable problem, right? It's like looking at like, oh, wow, how do we even address this? Yeah, that makes me think about all the innovation projects where we – think of this idea of failure as kind of a, being a problem because, you know, if, if it, it didn't become commercially viable, so it failed. Mm. But look at all the things that you learned along that path. Like, okay, so that was a dead end. You learned that was a dead, at minimum, you learned that's a dead end. We're not going to do that again. But also you might have learned why it that's turned right. out to be a dead end and you can apply that principle. So there's so much value in, in making these attempts. Um, and then, you know, saying no, closing the door when it's time. 
You know, I think also there's like an identity crisis too, right? Because it's like, am I an entrepreneur or am I a researcher slash academic, right? Because when Mm -hmm. you cross that threshold and then it's like, oh, this isn't like scaling like I thought. Sure, I learned these lessons, but do I want to continue being an entrepreneur or do I want to go back to what I know and what I love maybe? So, you know, I think there's there's it's a it's a really fascinating challenge and i I watched it from a distance because i've never really you know i've never been a researcher but it's it's super fascinating i i i feel it really personally now not so much the researcher side but the you know there's there's doing the actual work of designing these experiences and the curation and bringing people together and then there's the business side and I'm not a business person. That's not where I come. I mean, I am now because I put myself in that situation, but it's not my background. And so I'm, I've been thinking a lot about, well, where can we partner? Where maybe someone is a researcher who needs somebody who's, who's uh, got a stronger focus on the business. Maybe not everybody has to wear all of the hats (laughs) at the same time. There's got to be some interesting models. You know, I've seen some accelerators that have focused on helping academics commercialize some of their inventions Mm -hmm. and it it really you know the ones i've talked to you know tell me that it really depends on the university's policies around ip and so uh, much you know because if they've if they've locked it down too tight then it's like doesn't give them much wiggle room to even help the academic right Tech transfer is like this really boring thing that has such a huge impact. We're actually hearing about it a lot on the ecosystem show Mm. that you mentioned before. So every week we're visiting a different uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem, often in biotech. We're doing this one hour thing on on Clubhouse in lots of different places. So like this week was London, next week was Paris. Uh, And tech transfer comes up all the time in so many places. Uh, It really depends culturally uh, it depends on where you are by country, even by city, even by school, how the tech transfer office is thinking about IP. Sometimes the university has pressure on on the tech transfer office to make lots of money. And so then they ask faculty who are starting a business to give them lots and lots of equity in the business. And once they do that, it's not possible for VCs to invest. Mm. It's not they, They've made themselves into an, a, a non-investable business or the university has made it into a non-investable business. And so then it doesn't succeed and doesn't make money for the university either. At the same time, you know, there is, there is this agreement that's been made where it, where the university has, uh, has invested a lot and has an interest. And so working out what that's going to be is really important. A place that does it really well is university of San Diego. Oh, cool. If people want to investigate. Yeah, that's great. It's great to have examples where it's done well. So I want to just shift gears yet again. So this, um, as we kind of start to close here, I want to come back to something that really kind of struck me. You know, we've talked quite a few times previously, and it's it's all really focused around the corporate accelerator work. And you know, I'm just for the first time starting to to realize your background in learning and learning science and. And that's something that I've come to appreciate a lot in the last three years working with Eric, our VP of Learning Experience Design, and kind of thinking about how we train facilitators and ultimately launch our certification program. And when you mentioned that, it got my gears turning. I got really curious. I'd love to hear your thoughts, especially with this design-based research stuff you were doing around building mm-hmm. almost like adapting classroom or learning environment, Mm -hmm. what would be your advice to folks that maybe are tuning in that are interested in facilitation or, or just getting started, or maybe they're feeling like they're just need to up their game in some way, especially in these times of rapid change, you know, we're on S curves seem to be just killing S curves, you know, and this, this, the rate of change is just quite insane. I would imagine your concepts and your background could be quite informative for folks that are interested in amplifying their learning and how they can mm. and go about becoming better facilitators, um, better professionals. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how to navigate that and what the learning process, how, how people should approach the learning process right now. I think and often say that everybody has to be more entrepreneurial. We should be very, very good at being entrepreneurial as human beings. We should, we've evolved for it. We have two really strong capacities. 
One is about discipline and finishing things and uh, staying aligned. And we'll call that the discipline muscle. And it's particularly strong in those of us who liked school. If you liked school and did well at school, school is really good at building that discipline muscle. The other muscle is the initiative muscle. That's where we're going out on a limb. We're taking a risk. We're being creative. We're curious about what might happen if. Uh, and that muscle should also be very strong in us, right? We're, we're predators and we, we have to adapt. Right. So we're on, on the one hand, we're flock animals. We're very good on the discipline side. On the other hand, we are predators and we should be very good on the initiative side. But school doesn't really help us very much with the initiative side. So those of us who did well in school tend to be sort of weak in that particular muscle. And those of us who hated school might actually be a lot stronger in it because, you know, we made it happen that way. I'm, I'm the first kind. <laughs> So for me, learning by trying things out in the world uh, is really hard and scary, but it's so much faster and more efficient than going to school and getting a degree in it. Not to say that you shouldn't do that. When you know exactly what expertise you want, that can be really perfect. But when you're trying to figure out what's going to be my style of facilitation, let's see, let's say, what am I going to offer in particular? Or when you're trying to figure out who's the audience that's, that I can benefit most effectively so that I can create my line of work. I would say that the way to learn is to just try it. That's what tells you what questions to go look up on Google. That's what tells you where you need extra practice. That's what tells you what the unsolved problems are. So just, you know, and it's, you said something about it earlier too, uh, and it made me think, you know, this is what I thought being an adult was, and I really never did it before the last few years. I was always waiting for somebody to tell me which boxes I needed to check next. And so... I invite people to step over that line into the uncertain place where you just make a decision and it might be wrong. And that's where the learning comes from. I love that. So good. We often say practice makes practice. <laughs> well put. Excellent. Well, nice. it's been so good chatting with you today, Diana. And I want to invite you to leave our listeners with a final thought. So is there anything you'd like them to keep in mind or, you know, maybe how to find you or, or, or the work that you do? I just wanted to give you an opportunity to send a message. Thank you. Um, the easiest way to find me is at corporateacceleratorforum.com. You can sign up for our newsletter to learn about experiences that are coming up. And we have lots of them that are free and open. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. You're welcome to direct message me there. I think I'm the first Diana Joseph that comes up, although there are many of us. I'd love to, to, to talk to folks. It would be great. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me, Douglas. This was really thought-provoking for me. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Control the Room. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates when new episodes are released. And if you want more, head over to our blog, where I post weekly articles and resources about working better together. VoltageControl.com.